Welcome, everybody. I really appreciate your coming today. I'm, I believe that we can claim title to having the first post-partisan conference in Washington following this incredibly difficult battle in health reform. I'm Grace Marie Turner. I'm the president of the Galen Institute, and I'll be moderating um, this panel and also uh, serving as MC for our program today. And I, I want to start by thanking this just incredible team at the Galen Institute that has put together this conference. As you can well imagine, I've been much more focused on what's been happening in the, um, the arena on Capitol Hill over these last several months as we've been putting this conference together. And I want to give particular thanks to Jamie Burke, and Sterling Myers, our coalitions department at the Galen Institute for their really incredible work in, in knowing the, the right people to invite to talk about this incredibly important topic of intelligent health. And also to Tara Persico, Jenna Persico, Jeff Lundgren, and um, um, our, our really terrific team here for the work that we're doing. This is being um, broadcast on the internet, so I want to also welcome our, our internet viewers as well and to thank all of you for, um, for joining us virtually as well. The, the idea for this conference, this is the second, and I believe many of you actually came to our first one that we did in December to help um, really focus on the value of innovation in the health sector. We, um, I, did a, I testified before the Senate Commerce Committee in um, last summer, and Chairman Rockefeller stayed through the whole conference. It was me and, and four people that had been invited by the, the Democratic leadership staff. And he said, this is the only conference, the only hearing we've had all year where there really wasn't contention. Everybody agrees that we must have uh, policies that reward and encourage innovation in our health sector. And we are pleased to have here today leaders in business, in industry, in the policy community, from the medical profession, academia, and the media to really explore this topic. Whatever happens with the implementation of this legislation, it is crucially important that the, those writing the regulations and any refinements of this legislation continue to provide an incredibly strong foundation for the innovation that has really allowed our health sector to be the leader in the world in quality of medical care. There are opportunities ahead and there are barriers ahead. And as much as possible, I've asked our speakers to also talk about what they see in this legislation. It's, um, many of us have read the 2,700 pages of legislation. It will be, what, 2,850 after the reconciliation bill is passed. But it's, we need to study it and we need to really understand how this is going to impact the health sector and to make sure that the emerging concept of personalized medicine is underpinned and reinforced by the um, policies that are, that, are, that are being promoted and, and that are being uh, implemented now with this new legislation. The importance of personalized medicine, the importance of intellectual property protection, the importance of proper use of health IT, and we'll be exploring all those topics today. Um, and, and I hope you will be able to stay through our luncheon speech as well to hear about the operating room of the future. There is so much genius in our health sector. And it is important for all of us to, to rec I think we all recognize, but for policymakers to understand that that genius must be rewarded because it doesn't come from government, it comes from the private sector. And we want to make sure they understand that and that's rewarded in our health sector. I'm going to um, introduce each one of our speakers individually um, as before they speak, but I also will just give a brief introduction because Sterling has put together really a terrific program with much more in-depth biographies on each one. Our first speaker is Dr. Wayne Anderson, 
who's Director of Applied Genetics at GlaxoSmithKline and also an adjunct associate professor at professor, um, research professor at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. He has a career in respiratory clinical research and genetics, currently with GlaxoSmithKline, where he is Director of Applied Genetics. And he also is a recipient of the Glaxo Welcome Discovery Genetics Award for Innovation in Pharmacogenetics. He was um, previously with Steve Geige in, in Switzerland, where he headed the Pulmonary Pharmacology Research Division. And, um, won a research prize for his work with SIVA as well. So uh, welcome, Dr. Anderson, and welcome to all of you, and we will begin our program. Thank you, Grace Marie, for your very kind invitation to speak today. Uh, looks like a very promising and interesting agenda. Um, I have very few minutes to go through uh, the genetic basis of personalized medicine, and genetics plays a key role in personalized medicine in many aspects. And what I'll be trying to do today is to focus on one aspect of that, and that's pharmacogenetics, or the role of genetics in identifying modifiers of response, and that can be efficacy or safety. <laughs> There are a number of aspects that affect response to drugs, and I've tried to depict them in this, this graph or cartoon. Um, you can read through many of those, don't have time to focus on all of these, but many of them are key to the understanding of variability in drug response. And so I'll just hit a few of these, uh, in, including uh, geographical location, which also includes uh, both ethnicity and race. It has a tremendous impact on the frequency of adverse events, or efficacy, and especially related to the frequency of genetic markers. Point out drug formulation. It's not something that we often think about, but there are two aspects that drug formulation can impact. Uh, the first is in the area of respiratory diseases in which inhalers are more often used uh, to deliver drugs, and the simple technique of using an inhaler can have a dramatic impact on the amount of drug that a patient is exposed to. It also has a, a key role in identifying compliance of patients. So if you have a once a year or once a month uh, treatment that's administered in a, in a physician's office, such as by IV injection, you pretty much know about the compliance of that individual. You can keep the records. If there is an adverse event, you know the relationship of the time to the administration, etc. When you have a, a, a simple white tablet, or not many of them are white anymore, but if you have a simple tablet, you're really up to the, the um, the discretion of the patient to take that. And even in clinical trials, we know that compliance is really poor. So as you move away from the more rigid, standardized clinical trials to doing pharmacogenetics using databases, electronic medical health records, having access and knowing the frequency and the times of when people took these medications is critical to assessing whether that is really involved, either in the efficacy or an adverse event. Environment, as we know, plays a key role uh, as well, and this includes such things as diet, and I think we're all uh, pretty well aware of um, a number of drugs are markedly influenced uh, if you take them with um, grapefruit juice, which will induce many of the drug metabolizing enzymes. And of course, genetics is what I will try to focus on today. Okay, I'm going to illustrate um, six points that I think are critical for uh, a successful association of a genetic marker with a particular event. And I'm going to use uh, a case of, of a back of your hypersensitivity to illustrate this. Abacavir is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It's a highly effective treatment for HIV. And we have found through our clinical trials that about 5% of subjects develop a hypersensitivity response. And hypersensitivity um, Similar, but not exactly similar to what you would develop with penicillin, um, although the mechanisms of this are, are slightly different, but the concept is the same. Um, it's usually self-limiting, uh, although it's not always easy to diagnose, and uh, if you discontinue the drug, there's no long-term sequelae that, uh, that appear. Um, in the, most of the cases um, are um, 
resolve completely, and in the first instance, it's usually slow and onset, it includes such um, criteria such as uh, rash um, and GI symptoms, things that can be not easily diarrhea, things like this, that cannot be really attributed oftentimes to a particular drug interaction. However, if left uh, untreated, um, this can proceed to fatal events. So it is very important and has a marked effect on, on the use of um, the drug in HIV in terms of dealing with the adverse events and in terms of finding new effective retroviral uh, therapies. I'm gonna, I'm gonna now just quickly run through six of the key factors that made abacavir perhaps one of the most successful um, evidence of, of the role of genetics in determining uh, response, especially in adverse events. The first, the first point is that you need to have sufficient control or documentation of all of the covariates that were on my second slide. And while in clinical trials this is sometimes easier to do, if you move to doing pharmacogenetics, which is a, which is a, a trend that we see happening now using databases and especially using healthcare records, or uh, electronic records is having that kind of information is critical in the success of being able to incorporate these covariates into your analysis and interpretation of what you find. You need a strong determ a genetic determinant. If you're looking for a genetic marker, if the role of genetics is somewhat minor, then it's going to be very, very difficult to sort out even a small component that's genetically related. And the stronger the genetic component, the fewer patients that you need, and the easier it is to understand um, that particular association. This is a, a graph uh, that looks to, to um, document that association. And on the left axis, uh, um, the y-axis, you have the negative log of the p-value, the strength of the association, the statistical strength of the association. And on the x-axis below, you have the chromosome number. So we've, we've looked at over 500,000 markers across the entire genome to see if we can find something associated with this particular event. And I think you can see by the large peak on chromosome 6, it's in the what's called the HLA uh, area of, of the chromosome. Uh, we have a very strong signal, and this seems to be a sig single signal across the entire genome. To put that in perspective, in statistics, you usually accept as being statistically significant the p-value value of 0.05, which is 5 times 10 to the minus 2. The strength of this association approach is 10 to the minus 35. So it's a very, very strong signal. You need access to subjects. Um, in, in clinical trials, in relatively rare adverse events, usually defined by about a hundred, 1 in 100,000, you may not even see a particular adverse event in your clinical trials. In a back of year, uh, um, it, it lended itself to uh, pharmacogenetic evaluation because we had approximately 5%. So we had enough subjects in our clinical trials to be able to study this and, and, and account for the variants uh, with tight control. So uh, this just depicts the, uh, the frequency of this particular marker in populations around the world. You can see it does vary from 5 to 20 percent in India to uh, less than 1 percent in sub-Saharan Africa. So depending on where you decided to, to test for this association, um, you could have uh, fairly frequent um, frequencies of this marker. Uh, and this also seems to correlate fairly well with the incidence of hypersensitivity. In those countries that are listed zero, China and Japan, I really don't know the frequency of hypersensitivity and, and whether it develops in those countries. You need an accurate definition of, of what we call the phenotype, the clinical presentation. Um, this may seem like a, a, a no-brainer, but it actually is probably one of the most critical aspects of defining. You have to know what you're looking at. Uh, with a back of ear, we were somewhat fortunate in, in, in the development of a skin test, very similar to a test that's used for tuberculosis, the PPD test, except this is just a simple patch test. And if someone has suspected um, hypersensitivity or has developed hypersensitivity to a back of ear, you can use a patch test to look and see if there's a cutaneous response. You can see in this particular individual the large red circles in which there was a definite response, confirming that immunologically this patient probably had hypersensitivity. You need documentation uh, of the use of therapy. I don't have a slide for this. We've talked a little bit about this, but if we're going again to, to large databases to try to understand relatively rare events, 
um, perhaps what we have available to us are pharmacy records, which are, are not a good surrogate for actually determining the use of a particular drug, but it may be about the best we have. Next slide. And lastly, you need, you need to demonstrate clinical utility. Regardless of the strength of the genetic association, if it doesn't change the practice of medicine, it doesn't increase the safety or efficacy for a particular patient, then really it's not that useful. So with the back of here, we designed a study which we call PREDICT-1. Very simple in design. We had this marker. We knew that the strength of the association was very high from our clinical trials. But we needed to show the clinical utility. And in this study, we very simply randomized subjects to one of two treatment arms. Both treatment arms got a back of here. In the first treatment arm, subjects um, were given the usual precautions for anybody that would take a back of here about hypersensitivity, how to recognize it, to call your physician, etc. And they were placed into the trial. In the second group, they were pre-screened for um, of, um, having the marker HLA B5701, the marker of the strong association. And we eliminated all subjects that were positive for this marker. On the left two bars, you see the results uh, from the control group. This is a group that wasn't uh, screened for uh, this particular marker. And the incidence of, of hypersensitivity was about 7.8%. This is clinically defined, physician defined, clinically suspected hypersensitivity. And in the control group, we still saw 3.4%. So we, we, at that particular point, if we had no other way of assessing, we would say that the, that the test was about 50% sensitive in eliminating or having an impact, which is significant in its own right um, and, and adds dramatically. On the right, we took those subjects that had suspected clinical hypersensitivity and we did a patch test on them, very similar to what I showed you. So this is the immunologically confirmed hypersensitivity. You can see the incidence dropped markedly in the control group, so that's probably true hypersensitivity, which is overdiagnosed by the physicians. And on the right, in the group that was screened, it was 0%. Okay. Lastly, uh, just to show you that uh, it had an impact in, the, in a small area in Western Australia, we looked at, uh, which adopted a, a, um, uh, a rule in, in anybody that was going to be given or considered for a back of ear as treatment for HIV, they had to be tested first for their association with this marker. And anybody that had the marker was not given a back of ear. And to the left, you can see the incidence of hypersensitivity, and to the right, following the, ins the introduction of this particular test, um, that the rate of hypersensitivity has dropped markedly. So two instances in where we've shown clinical utility. So just to summarize then, I've taken this um, uh, off. Uh, you can find this particular uh, group of, of statements uh, in both the NIH as well as the Institute for Systems Biology that claims responsibility for this. And it does follow. Pharmacogenetics is part of what was called P4 medicine. It's personalized. You can see from the back of your example, it certainly is predictive. It does tell who is at risk for having this uh, particular uh, event. It's preventative. If you test first, you can pretty much eliminate the cases of hypersensitivity. And it's participatory. The physician and patient can use this information uh, to make their decisions on healthcare. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. I think that's a, a wonderful introduction to the incredible potential of personalized medicine to make sure people are getting the right medicines at the right time, but to make sure that's the right medicine for them and we can predict that. It's really quite an extraordinary solution. And the the way that we're going to begin to help to make people understand the potential of this new science is through information systems. And we have Scott Jenkins, Dr. Scott Jenkins, who's Director of Healthcare and Life Sciences Solutions Sales with Dell, to talk with us about how his company is working to transform healthcare delivery to make sure these new scientific medical miracles actually reach the patient. Dr. Jenkins. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to come and speak. This is uh, pretty exciting. Um, I have uh, eight minutes, 12 slides, and I think five topics. <laughs> so I'll go as quickly as I can, and uh, if I go too quickly, feel free to grab me, and we can do a deep dive into just about any of the different things. Um, next slide. 
Thank you. Recently, I, I um, had been given the sort of closing session at Personalized Medicine World Congress, and I like to bring things that are topical. So that day, Time Magazine came out with a focus on epigenetics. I thought that was interesting. So I went to grab um, the uh, uh, image to be able to talk about the relevance of that. It's a very interesting article, and there's a PBS special about it as well, um, about um, uh, the impact of, of individual um, uh, sessions within people's lives and heredity and their impact on future generations. It's pretty exciting. But the interesting things that were the, the three things at the end, if you could click maybe three times, genetics, DNA, and health and medicine. I was like, well, that's what I'm going to talk about. Those are the three things that I'm actually going to be talking about. And so um, within the talk today, I'm going to try to touch on all three of those things. And there's, a, there's an interwoven thread. Uh, but for you know, our point of view, uh, much of this, most of this is data driven. And so the ability to get to the to capture the data, get to the data, and make make meaningful use of the data is really going to be key. Next slide, please. So um, within our healthcare system, we think about uh, where data resides today. Much of it resides within hospitals. Uh, um, of the top 100 hospitals, there are HIS systems, health information systems, through most of those hospitals. If you click the next slide, but within the given community of where health is delivered, it's most of the information resides in physician practice. Small doc practices own about 90 or, or have access to and, and contain about 90% of patient information on paper. And so with, with ERA, um, if you can click the next slide, moving across, we start to see the ability and, and, and real value of this connected community, thinking about the fact that healthcare is delivered regionally, it's delivered locally, and using those points of connection. Uh, and so within the employed physicians, there's certainly a, a captive market um, in terms of what the hospital decides they want to do in terms of the, the systems they want to deploy. But within a given community, there really aren't too many standards. And what we believe is that the adoption uh, by the affiliated physicians in conjunction with an exchange around the hospitals will help drive value of that information and value of exchange. Uh, because it's delivered regionally, and, and so if you have a patient that you see as primary care, they're going to go to a hospital, it'll probably be locally, and then they're going to come back to you. And the compendium of information about that patient should uh, really reside with that primary care physician. They should be able to see your continuum of record. Go to the next one, please. And we start to see um, connectivity within the community, but even within a simple model, there are several independent physicians, and we're trying to build routes to get them connected, not only um, uh, through the ERA process, but as independent physicians, how do they get access to exchanges? Uh, next slide. And so, um, you know, in a very simple diagram here, we're looking to, to build the capability of exchange. And uh, recently, um, Dallas purchased Perot Systems. Uh, Perot's managed, Perot Systems uh, has historically managed, um, I think, 350 of the largest hospitals within the US. A uh, huge amount of, of data resident within those systems. And so the logical extension to um, really move out into the community in terms of a connected health network um, really makes a lot of sense. And so that's, that's really our approach and our our plan is to be able to get information so it's in an exchangeable format and connected. Next slide, please. Um, and the advantage of the exchange is really driven by a, a technology that was developed for telecommunications industry around exchange. So if you have one phone, you have one. You have two phones, you have one connection. Five phones, you have ten connections. But as you start to grow the interconnectivity, with twelve phones, you have sixty-six connections. And you had and this this model applies applied to the fax system. It applies to social networking. It applies to the internet. And so we believe that the same type of application about value and the ability to look at best practices, the ability, the ability to look across patient populations, will happen when an exchange is populated, not just because an exchange exists. Next slide, please. So health, you know, EMR, electronic medical record, a point of capture of information is going to be key. That's the first evolution that's coming. The next evolution that's coming is around single molecule. And so uh, if you could click, um, we've got and one more. Over the last uh, three generations of sequencing, um, Dell has been critical in terms of being the point of capture uh, for each of the technologies around de novo sequencing, around um, microarrays, and around the new um, single molecule system. And so uh, the impact is, if you think about the, the first human genome took seven years, cost a billion dollars, and generated 300 terabytes. And that was one um, genome. 
and then we can talk about the number of errors that might have been incorporated in that based on the, the, the technology. The ability to look at biomarkers around affymetrics and, and some of the microarray technologies helped us move quickly into analytics, looking for those specific biomarkers, although the process itself was similar. Uh, and then the third aspect, though, is, is how we're starting to move into high throughput sequencing. Being able to look at a molecule or, 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 or a DNA and ultimately towards a, hu a whole human genome. Next slide. The impact, though, and so we have a lot of things that go on, right, wet chemistry and prep, but the key is, and please click the next slide, um, right now each of these devices generates about a terabyte of data every 30 minutes. Arguably, a human genome costs around $20,000 to produce. I know there's complete genomics and a few other people that think they can get to $5,000 or, or, you know, the goal within um, two years is to get it to $1,000. But the devices themselves will generate 10 terabytes of data. Now, if you think about storing the data, processing the data, it's going to need a small supercomputer. And then moving that data around will need a ultra-high bandwidth network. We have to think about architectures that allow us to not only capture the genome data, but do things with it in a smart fashion from, from a design perspective. So whether you're a research institute, if you're a hospital facility, if you're a diagnostics facility, this will impact um, all the types of things that you do. And the key is differentiation of individuals. That's really what this does. Next slide, please. If we think about, and again, this is a 10-year-old slide that came from science, um, but the patient life cycle around genomics is, is ultimately going to be key. And we're at that point now. If you're, if you're in Norway today, every parent and newborn baby will have a DNA sample taken. Um, and they put into that repository for the population. This, this will allow, as, as the technology evolves, the cost of sequencing goes down and the annotation of the uh, different databases, we're going to start to see value in developing life plans for individuals. And that's absolutely going to be key. Next slide, please. Um, and then what we heard earlier about, you know, one size doesn't fit all around pharmacogenomics is absolutely key. You know, my... Um, uh, one of the things I'm extremely passionate about is theragnostics, right? And, and next slide. Um, the idea of coupling a diagnostic test with therapeutic delivery for the correct patient population. We look at Herceptin, one of the best examples, but arguably there are about five in the marketplace today that have a required diagnostic test before you can administer the therapy, right? Herceptin, Gleevec, Herbitox, and a few others. The idea is as you understand what will be effective for the population, you can move very quickly to get them the right medication or start to subsegment within compounds that are, are arguably Me Too compounds. And we'll see an example of that in just a minute. But all of the diagnostics that reside behind this will ultimately be driven by genomic data. Next slide, please. So, so one of the things that's interesting, so everyone talks about, um, you know, Lipitor is the big change, right? We're going to see it's coming off patent. They're going to drop arguably $10 billion in revenue. But I think the most interesting thing on this slide is the number two, please click, um, is Plavix, right? And so if you haven't been following the news, so for the other medications, if you have a genetic variant, you may receive the drug. This has been given guidance by the FDA. If you have a genetic variant, you may not or should not receive the drug. It hasn't gone to full, you can't get it. But the variation, and this came out just this week, of these poor metabolizers for Plavix, which can really put the patient at risk, um, it's about 2% in white, 4% in black, but 14% in Chinese descent. And so the familial history, the phenotypic data, combined with a diagnostic test for these genetic variants, is really key in terms of getting the medication out there. But from a policy perspective, what happens with these drugs, these, these vastly used drugs in the marketplace, as we start to find these variants later? Do we put a restriction on? Do we have people get retested? So a gating factor for the other medications was efficacy in clinical trials. These have high efficacy, and how do we call that out in terms of diagnostic tests? Uh, and and um, I have, next slide. A couple of key examples. So here's one that's very interesting about familial history, or actually around HIPAA, right? Um, if you could click. So one of the questions was, and again, if you talk to any physician, one of the most important things is familial history, right? It's one of the things they take, family history. Let me know about you as an individual. If we think about how healthcare was delivered in 40 years ago in rural areas, a physician knew you, they knew your mother, you knew their father, you knew your uncle, they, they knew your brothers and sisters. They followed you through your life, and they knew everything about your familial history. 
Um, so the question is, if a family member is deceased, can you get their health information? The answer is yes, it turns out. But there's only two ways. So click, please. The first way is, if you have a disease, your physician, not you, can request your familial health information of someone who's been deceased. The other is, if you could click again, um, if you've been giving living, living power of attorney. So I don't know about you, but I don't know of many people that have living power of attorney for health information for their family. Um, I'm, a lend, um, I'm amending my will and trust for my children so that they can get access to all of my information. But um, uh, my, I have, uh, my father has a tissue sample at Mayo Clinic from cancer that he had. My grandfather has a tissue sample at the Mayo Clinic that he had. I would sure like to run some of these genetic markers, genomic tests on it. Even with these two provisions in HIPAA, I can't do that. Because new tests can't be run, only access to information that exists and only through these two vehicles. And so I think the unintended consequence of protecting individuals has excluded the familial history that is absolutely valuable to predictive health around the personalized medicine space. Um, I'm almost uh, complete. Here's three quick examples of applications of this. Uh, in 2007, there's a very interesting video log on the New York Times uh, website. So here's a woman who's 33 years old, uh, asymptomatic for any cancer, but she did her family tree. She goes in and realizes that um, she needs a diagnostic test. She's positive for BRCA1. Click, please. Um, she uh, consults an oncologist, and they put together a bunch of options for her. They can do diagnostic monitoring which says that, well, we're going to watch you until it manifests and then we'll treat you because that's how our health care <laughs> delivers care. Uh, or we can do some preventative measures, including, you know, tamoxifen with all the side effects for a healthy individual. Um, if you can click again, please. She opts for a double mastectomy. So here's a challenge for the healthcare system. Predictive genomics would indicate that this is the best measure to ensure that she won't get breast cancer and secondarily probably ovarian cancer based on her family history. But she doesn't have the disease. So the, the physicians have a real challenge in trying to, to opt to do this. The health, com the, the insurance community has a big challenge. But her decision was she believes this will be the healthiest course of action she can have to extend her life. Uh, next example. Um, an individual is diagnosed with high cholesterol. And, he try and so he tries this medication. He tries to wise click, please. Um, uh, his side effects were too high. I just, you know, I couldn't stand the side effects. Click again. I try Lipitor, and it works for me. And if you can click, this is the CEO of Novartis. So no matter how politically uncomfortable it is, you don't get to pick which medicine works for you. The side effects for statins alone, if someone could just come up with a statin screen, I think would be incredible. Uh, but it doesn't matter who you are. Your biology and the drugs that you, or the medicines that you're able to take um, are really dependent on you as an individual. And then the last example, please. Um, uh, female is 40 is healthy, um, no family history that is, uh, they decide to have a family. Uh, she has several miscarriages and she goes in for a workup and almost no indication is, it really comes out other than slight uh, SFH um, uh, increase. Um, three IVF cycles ended. Um, she goes to a new physician, if you could click, and they have a brand new genetic diagnostic test out around PAI, so a genetic variant of plasminogen activator inhibitor. So it, it basically it's the opposite of hemophilia, it's high clotting. And so they decide on experimental treatment around um, a blood thinner, um, and if you can click to the next slide. So what happened? Was medicine successful because of diagnostics? Click please. Um, she has two girls. Click again. Same course of treatment, she has a boy. If you can click one more time. This is important um, because this is my story. It's because of that genetic test that we got to where we are. Now the challenge is that my three children, I will bet you, and I, we haven't been tested, for, they haven't been tested, they will have the same genetic variant that my wife has. And so that we will have a genetic history to give to them that will allow them to change the course of their life in the future. Thank you for your time today.
Thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. So a wonderful way to, to bring home in a very personal way the value of the research that all of you do. Thank you for, for sharing that. These slides, by the way, are available online. We didn't um, print them out for you. Everything's electronic. So available at galen.org at galen and also healthreform.org. And not only will the, um, is this presentation being broadcast live, but Andrew Pawlowski, who is our um, Deputy Director of Communications, is also um, going to make sure that we have experts and film clips as well available on both the Galen, at galen.org as well as uh, healthreform.org. To, to um, bring this one step further to how we take this information uh, to the world. We have Donald Casey, who's the Chief Executive Officer of West Wireless Health Institute, Chief Executive Officer as of March 2010. So he's just uh, recently in this new position after 25 years of global healthcare experience in um, identifying and commercializing medical innovations. And clearly there are lots of new ideas here all day for you. Mr. Casey, the, um, the West Wireless Institute is really looking at how to harness these innovations, technologies, and to use not only advocacy but ed education to make sure that they are, they are pushed out into the marketplace, not only in the United States but globally. So welcome, Mr. Casey, and look forward to your presentation as well, and we'll take your questions for a few minutes. Thank you, Chris Marie, and thank you for the invitation to uh, come and, and finish this segment out. It's, it's interesting when you talk about genomics and you talk about large databases, we like to think of ourselves at the West Wireless Institute, we're going to put the last mile in is how do we create personalized medical devices that can either diagnose or monitor a lot of the treatments that we're, we're talking about. Yeah, so we'll just, we'll, we'll take the laser and we'll, we'll hit Sterling with it. Um, just because uh, Grace Marie mentioned that we're a relatively new organization, uh, a brief commercial of what is West Wireless is founded uh, about a year ago by uh, Gary and Mary West with the uh, idea that how can you put a significant amount of money into a kind of a brand new field which is wireless health and how do we accelerate the development of that with the entire idea of ultimately how do you uh, create a significant force within the marketplace that will drive down costs while delivering superior outcomes. I think Grace Marie uh, did a nice job outlining it. You know, if, if you look at the first two presentations, you know, genomics, and, and you begin to talk about the excitement that innovation is going to bring into the pharmaceutical area, and when you, I, I had 25 years at Johnson & Johnson, and one of the things that we were pioneering at that point is we had a diagnostic division and a pharmaceutical division, and the idea of how do you create a companion diagnostic right when you're developing the initial pharmaceutical product. And if you're at this point marketing Plavix, you would have loved to have that biomarker developed a little bit earlier. And uh, potentially you wouldn't have seen a larger marketplace, but you wouldn't be fighting a black box warning today. Then you look at data-driven health that Scott just talked about. Um, for us, we, we think there needs to be the last mile. And if we could go to the next slide, Cheryl. You know, for, for us is how, how do you begin to look at a transformation in diagnosis and monitoring? And uh, when we talk about wireless health, mHealth, uh, it, it is a kind of a transformative stage that we're in right now where we're looking to how do you take low-cost sensors, and I'll show you a few in a second, where we think you're going to be able to develop relatively sophisticated, uh, whether it's RFID technology or other sensor technology that will be able to put some form of telemetry in that will basically take advantage of what's become a ubiquitous telecommunications network and the basic ubiquitousness of the internet. So take these low-cost sensors, take a telecommunication network, um, and then you basically begin to look at sophisticated algorithms that if you just listen to what Scott is talking about, how do you begin to identify patterns of when you're being consistently monitored over time? And then you basically push that back out. So uh, Grace Marie actually said we weren't allowed to bring up our cell phones, so I, I, I can't actually show you one of the uh, one of the, the ideas here. But you know, as you as you uh, as you move forward, uh, literally you are going to see whether it's in COPD or congestive heart failure or diabetes. Uh, at some point, we think there's going to be the availability of a low-cost monitor, probably in the range of ultimately the monitor might cost as little as ten cents. 
uh, that would include some form of diagnostic as well as a telemetry device that will push it off to a base station. Uh, that will literally get picked up and it will get moved in a HIPAA compliant fashion, of course, to a server that will run through an algorithm. And over time, as the algorithms get a little bit more sophisticated, we then believe that this will be, allow the algorithm to push back out to either a healthcare provider or the patient or a caregiver a, a message that will engage them. So whether it's a, somebody with type 1 diabetes as a child going to school for the first time and, and a parent is concerned about whether or not they're correctly dosing their insulin, or whether it's going to be a concerned caregiver that's looking at a parent with congestive heart failure and literally would be able to get a message in terms of how things are monitored and set to outline a course of action. This, this next generation, and you'll see a couple of talks today where we talk about next gen Web 2 uh, EMRs and whatnot, we believe that we're the second generation in remote monitoring. Uh, for about the last 10 years, the ICD, uh, you know, the pacemaker and other areas have had implantable electronic devices uh, that there has been considerable discussion about whether things should be reimbursed for these implantable medical devices. Uh, they have tended to be relatively high cost and over time, even though they've tried to open up, they still run on closed networks. The second gen is going to go to, we don't believe it's going to be implantable. We do think uh, at this point they'll be relatively low cost and they'll be built on open systems. So we think that's a pretty significant change. And then it, it's very interesting when you talk about genomics and you talk about high-risk uh, patients that Scott just identified, you know, ultimately if you want to take uh, some of the direction that we are beginning to see in the case of breast cancer, if you could identify a high-risk patient, how do you put a relatively low-cost monitoring device that would allow there to be a decision about when there is needed a course of therapy or if you take congestive heart failure, I'll give you an example in a second, how do you identify probably two to three weeks earlier that there is about to be an episode that, require, that will require hospitalization and rather than put somebody in the case of in, in, with uh, congestive heart failure back into a hospital for an expensive round of IV diuretics, how do we monitor that and take care of that within the home? For us, the benefits of wireless health boil down to a lot of rights. You've, you've heard the four P's and you hear a lot of the, the right therapy, the right time. Uh, for us, a, a, a different spin on this would be where the patient is. Um, I think Scott's statistics were terrific in terms of showing how many large hospitals are. Uh, one of the things of West Wireless is we, we would like to cut the number of hospitalizations uh, down in half over time just because we believe ultimately that's where you're going to save money in the healthcare system. And uh, when we're talking about family members, I, I have a 75-year-old father who's uh, now on a, a second round of hip replacement and, uh, you know, ultimately he's beginning to get concerned about how, how mobile am I going to be. Well, I, I know my dad really well and I know that there's no chance that the, the words assisted living are going to show up in his vocabulary. So how do we find a way to deliver some form of technology where he is, which will be a lot less expensive than assisted living or any other options? Here are three examples of what we call kind of Gen 2 airstrip technologies, which is actually a fetal monitor that can go uh, literally a, a fetal monitor and a mother monitor uh, and actually get the data delivered right to a cell phone in real time. Uh, so you, you basically have the opportunity to look at a high-risk pregnancy situation and identify whether or not there's distress on either part of the mother or the baby. If you look at Corvenus, this is the PIX device. Uh, this is actually uh, will take the place of halter monitors and other things. But this device will, li will literally measure uh, six different biometric uh, readouts. It will provide an opportunity to, to notice change in fluid as well as the ejection fraction uh, within the heart, which will actually allow you to identify somebody who is at risk for a congestive heart failure hospitalization episode probably 10 to 14 days earlier than conventional means right now. The last issue, and Wayne mentioned several times, wouldn't it be nice to know if the patients in a clinical actually took the pill? Well, there's several technologies now, uh, including one from Proteus, which is actually involves putting an RFID chip into a pill that would probably cost about one to two cents. Literally, the digestive process will actually activate the RFID chip, which will indicate that the pill has been taken. It's picked up on a small sensor that's actually moved to a base station and you can identify whether or not the patient has taken a pill. Before you get a little bit too big brother that you, you want uh, people really knowing this, if you could put this in a situation where there is some concern about mental health and, and whether somebody has really thought through uh, 
you know, in schizophrenia, whether they've taken the medication. In the case of uh, a parent wanting to monitor a child or other things, we think there's real terrific applications there. And obviously, this is going to we're going to have to work through a lot of different ways. Though it is not Big Brother, are you really taking the pill? But it's remarkable uh, if you look at the potential clinical applications. When you're talking about, you can literally prove whether somebody has taken the pill as you go forward. If we go uh, one, just jump. Mentioned congestive heart failure. This is kind of the uh, the pattern today. And if you look at the cost of hospitalizations and rehospitalization, congestive heart failure consistently shows up as one of the most expensive. All right. So if you basically look at somebody had an event, uh, basically you begin to see some uh, the, the person feels some distress in terms of not being able to breathe as there's a fluid buildup around the heart. Uh, basically because we're working all the time. Uh, you know, I just feel a little bit under the weather, and they're basically going to ignore symptoms that would generally send off alarm bells where there should be a change in their treatment. Um, and ultimately, this person winds up in the hospital where instead of managing through a couple pills that could have been taken on an oral basis where there could have been some titration done with, uh, in a partnership with a physician, they're going to wind up in a, in a five to seven day episode in a hospital where you're going to be do using I IV diuretics. Um, and then there's a, obviously there's some risks that when you go into a hospital with a compromised patient, could they pick something else up? In our world, if we go to the next slide, uh, we think there's an opportunity for significant change. If you look at the Corvenus device that we can basically put people on during the first 30 days once they leave the hospital after an, an initial congestive heart failure episode, we would really, we believe, have the opportunity to begin to monitor whether or not the patient is getting some distress, whether they're seeing fluid buildup, uh, and whether there's changes in the injection fraction. And uh, <clears throat> as you look at it, if, if you're able to identify that and you begin to see distress, how does that get picked up and moved to a physician? How does the physician make a learned decision to say, either I need to engage the patient or not. The other interesting thing is literally you would be able to sit there and say if you combine that device with uh, you know, the Proteus device, is, is the person taking their therapy? If Are they out of their pills? Literally you can have Medco and other people now offering services where literally they will be able to stock the pharmaceutical based off the compliance and you would be able to tell whether or not they need to do that through the Corvenus device. So it totally changes this. <clears throat> the average, unfortunately, the average cost of somebody who's rehospitalized with congestive heart failure is $25,000. <clears> and we believe ultimately that you can take a tremendous amount of cost out of the system by employing a, what we would call a wireless health uh, idea. So what, what's it going to take? And this is our, our plea from the policy perspective. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful, actually. The CTIA, which is the Cell Phone Association, has about 100,000 people in uh, Las Vegas for their annual convention this year. And for the first time, uh, wireless health was given uh, a, a relatively large presence out there. And the interesting question was, you, you had all the telecoms, you had a, a bunch of large uh, software manufacturers, you had a bunch of medical device manufacturers, all basically saying, this is a great idea, we can be transformative how we're going to save money, but who's going to pay for it? Uh, so that's the first question. What's the regulatory pathway? Uh, you know, as you begin to look at a wireless sensor, is, is that actually a medical device? And then if that medical device is transmitting data to somebody, is the pathway that that's uh, transmitted over potentially cell phone lines, is that actually become a medical device? So there's a number of questions there. There's a fair amount of uh, legal question in terms of where does the liability lie. It's interesting that the five major uh, telecoms at this point are very, very concerned and, and are not really pushing into the wireless health arena over concerns that they would be the deepest pockets within this chain and then therefore they would be potential targets for litigation if literally there was data transmitted over their network and somebody didn't react to it. Um, and, you know, privacy is obviously a significant concern and ultimately one of the questions about how do you practice medicine across state lines. Um, if you begin to see wireless health transmitted from state A to state B, how do you begin to evaluate whether or not that technology has the ability to let a doctor practice across state lines? So it's pretty significant. And then, you know, the last issue is right now, because there's lack of clarity around the reimbursement of the business model as well as some of the legal issues, the investment climate in this area has been uh, somewhat rugged. Uh, if you were talking to people actually looking for financing. So, well, certainly no one is going to guarantee a sure thing. <clears throat> if there was some clarity in a couple of these different areas, and again, if you're not looking for perfect clarity, if there was some 
idea of direction that there was a commitment at the policy making level that we, we really believe that this is going to be the last mile. So when you talk about genomics, database medicine, and wireless health or personalized medical devices, uh, you, you think you, we begin to see a ability to totally transform how healthcare is delivered in the country. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a, really a fabulous, fabulous opening to our conference and, and really setting the, the theme for the incredible potential that science and technology are bringing to the quality of healthcare delivery and the efficiency of healthcare delivery in this country. Uh, thank you all very much. And we do have time for a few questions. Anne Fitzgerald of AC Fitzgerald and Associates and one of our team members at the Galen Institute and Jeff Lundgren have microphones and we would ask you to, um, to identify yourselves, tell us who you are and um, do speak into the microphone so that those that are um, following us on the web will be able to hear your questions. So I will invite some questions. Anybody want to be brave and be first? John Hoff. I'm sorry, this is, this is a question and not a, um, not a comment, although they seem to be a comment. I, uh, for Mr. Casey and Fletcher, discussion of the problems of getting the, the wireless system into place was um, it was fascinating, and what we were talking about here, some Fulcher, is um, is are those devices that you described, whereby you would warn the patient and her doctor that something was going to happen? Do you suppose that's a preventive health care uh, service, and therefore is required to be covered under the new act without copays? That's that's a really interesting question. We Literally, we've been stripping down the act over the, over the last couple of days trying to understand what exactly is the definition of preventive. If somebody's got more clarity on that than, than we do, uh, we, we would love to hear it because uh, we're, we're hopeful that you could uh, begin to move treatment from an acute event into a preventive event and qualify. Um, but we're, we haven't seen as much uh, clarity as we would like at this point. But again, we haven't, we haven't seen the final reconciliation bill, and uh, we'll, we'll see which way it goes. I'd just like to, to implore all of you to make sure that the members of Congress in the areas where your, your companies are based and the White House understands what you're doing because you are bringing the kinds of solutions to the country in efficiency, incredible quality of care, personalization of medicine, and importantly, bringing down the cost of care. People think new technology always means, oh, well, that's just going to cost more money. And I think you've shown today that not only can you deliver better quality care, but you can save money tens of thousands of dollars in an individual patient on just one avoided hospitalization by use of these uh, the new technologies the new, um, and the new ways of getting better care to patients. So I really, that's, that's my message to you to make sure people know about this. We we'll probably have one time for one more question before we move on to our keynote speaker. But anyone be brave? Yes, sir. Please again tell us who you are. The microphone's right there. Richard, uh, Richard Singerman. Uh, this question both for uh, Mr. Jenkins and Mr. Casey. Um, I was at a presentation the other week where a neurologist was starting to do real-time stroke consults using his droid phone. He takes the video, uh, the, the intensivist in the hospital maybe takes the video, he's looking at looking at this in his droid phone and he's having G-chats with you know three or four different ICUs. So there's already kind of almost informal usage of the networks for critical real-time care. Is that doc putting himself at immediate risk? Is he inadvertently putting, you know, Google or Verizon at risk? Um, if, what could you illuminate that? Yeah, it, it, you can look at it. There's a number of different uh, small networks that have cropped up. You're starting to see it about uh, ultrasounds in pregnancy, and actually uh, people are starting to use their iPhones as the recipient device of that, moving it over the network. You know, it, the conclusion at Las Vegas when you talk to the telecom folks and you talk to Google was at this point they don't feel they're liable, and they, they don't feel that they're accepting a, a specific liability if, if they're moving data across. The interesting question would be there were probably some people in Washington that would feel the physician is at some point 
uh, potentially putting that person at risk. Um, but ultimately, you know, this is one of the reasons that we're looking for some clarification around how do you do set up some form of a discussion at least at, at the uh, at the policy level. At the, the National Broadband Act, and I'm not sure everyone read that. I mean, it's, it's been a busy week in, in, in Washington to read the, the Broadband Act and, and the Health Care uh, Reform Act. Uh, there, there was interesting, there was about 25 pages uh, about e-health and, and the role of health care there. And actually, one of the provisions is that there would be a joint hearing between the FCC and the FDA within 120 days of that being accepted. Um, where one of the topics, if you kind of page through that, would be discussion about where does liability begin to lie and, and how do you create, uh, you know, uh, an environment where there isn't, you can use the network or should there be, even be bandwidth set aside specifically for health. So it, it, it's clearly on the radar screen here, but it, it's, uh, there's a lot of questions, not as many answers as you, you'd like to see. And very important that we get this right. Um, thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking this just really fabulous panel. Thank you all. And I ask that my Dr. Brailer, if you would come up and look at our keynote, let's start.